Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. All right, you guys, I am having a little bit of a rough time right now. And if you are also having a rough time, just hope you feel a little bit more assured that a lot of us are in the same boat right now. It's not fun to see your friends go through hard times. But there is some comfort that comes from knowing that other people also understand and see you and hear you. So today we're going to talk about antidepressants because that is the problem I am having right now in not having had access to them for a little bit and then having to taper back on them. So I was not able to taper off. I had to go cold turkey on some SSRIs for a couple of weeks. And that is bad news bears. So today, we're going to talk specifically about SSRIs. We're going to talk about their side effects, the side effects of discontinuing them, as well as how to appropriately go off of antidepressants. So first up, Specifically, what are SSRIs? SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, and it is a type of antidepressant medication. So they're really commonly prescribed antidepressants because they generally have very few side effects. They can treat a variety of conditions. Sometimes people use them for antidepressants and anti-anxiety. And there are a couple of different ways that you and your doctor can decide whether or not an SSRI may be the right choice for you. As we've discussed in a previous episode, SSRIs pretty much work by keeping the serotonin that you have available from being reabsorbed into your body. So normally it gets used and then it's reabsorbed, but instead... This just circles it back into being used again right now. And that's really important, especially if you don't have as many serotonin receptors as other folks, or if you don't have as much serotonin available in your body. So that's more or less the layman's terms of how these things work. If you'd like a more in-depth conversation about it, check out one of our previous episodes about serotonin and or depression. So, what do SSRIs treat? As I mentioned, sometimes they can be used to treat anxiety as well. But they're also used sometimes to treat obsessive-compulsive disorder, panic disorder, bulimia, PTSD, PMDD, so premenstrual dysphoric disorder, hot flashes caused by menopause as well. So, Anxiety is often treated with SSRIs, and they are approved by the FDA specifically for that purpose. But all SSRIs may also be used off-label to treat anxiety. Technically, only escitalopram, paroxetine, and sertraline are approved specifically by the FDA for that purpose. The rest of them may be used off-label for it, and that's totally okay. When we hear something termed as being used off-label, that means that you are being prescribed a drug that has been approved by the FDA for one specific purpose, and you're just using it for a different purpose that hasn't necessarily been approved. 
And it's not that the FDA doesn't want to provide it, but rather because they haven't been asked to evaluate the drug for that particular purpose or treatment course. So that just means that that purpose isn't included in the drug label that is required to go on products when the FDA approves them. So when the FDA approves a drug, they work with the manufacturer to create a label for that drug, and that includes both the label on the drug package and a report that's called the package insert. And that package insert, you've probably seen it before, has the recommended dosage regarding how much and how often you should be taking the specific pharmaceutical, how it should be taken, like by mouth, etc., the age range of people that it's recommended to treat, and any side effects that the drug could cause. So you've seen that on ibuprofen even, simple things that you can get over the counter. So that's all that it really means. It's kind of like taking an Excedrin migraine pill also for menstrual cramps. So if you have menstrual migraines, you may just want to go ahead and do two birds, one stone, and take that. So it might not say it's for menstruation on the label. Perhaps it does. I'm not looking at an Excedrin migraine bottle right now. I'm just trying to provide an example for you guys. But you're taking it off label for the cramps if it says it's specifically for something different. So in the case of some SSRIs, you may be prescribed them for what they are labeled for, which is antidepressants, but you can also use them off-label for anxiety. And that works for a lot of folks. So if you go to your doctor and you say that you're having trouble with both anxiety and depression, then they very well may prescribe you an SSRI to treat both instead of giving you two different medications. In general, SSRIs are pretty similar to each other in terms of how effective they are and how they work in your body by just keeping that serotonin in use in your brain instead of reabsorbing it into your bloodstream. So they don't actually create any more serotonin. They don't make extra serotonin in your body. They just help you to use more of what's already there. So they are all generally about the same in effectiveness, but they vary just a little bit in what they're used to treat, the side effects of the specific ones, their specific dosage, and a few other factors, like how you're supposed to taper off of them. So there are a bunch of different SSRIs that are out there today. Earlier, we mentioned the generic names for some of them, like escitalopram is Lexapro, Paroxetine is Paxil or Pexiva. Sertraline is Zoloft. Those are the three that are also approved by the FDA to be used on label for anti-anxiety medication. But you can also still get Celexa or Prozac, Seraphim, Luvox for depression and anxiety. But those would just be used off-label for anxiety, on-label for depression. There are some possible side effects for SSRIs. That includes nausea, dry mouth, headache, having trouble sleeping, especially if you are new to the medication or if you are going up a level in your dosage. You may have trouble sleeping and you may have some tiredness. That's also why they recommend that you take these earlier in the day don't take them right before bed because they may keep you awake. The earlier in the day that you take them, when you first wake up, I say day, but I understand a lot of folks are on different shifts. So when you take, when you wake up for the day is really what we're saying. That's when they want you to really take it to help avoid those sleep problems as much as possible and any tiredness. But aside from sleep issues, it can also cause issues with diarrhea, weight gain, increased sweating, rashes, nervousness, and sexual dysfunction. Some folks will have some of these types of side effects, but you want to talk to your doctor about it because the side effects may be temporary. And if it's something you're able to weather, like having a little increased sweating for a bit or just having a little bit of trouble sleeping for a while, then that may be something that it could still work for you in the long run. Just like taking care of acne and washing our skin, 
we have to give the medications that we put into our bodies as well as the ones that we put on our bodies some time to work via consistent use. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about SSRI safety and risks. Stay tuned. As you all well know, I wear many hats, and one of those hats is in freelance writing. As a freelancer, I am a big fan of crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing allows you to work with many different designers who can compete to win your budget. This process allows small businesses and independent operators to tap top international design talent at a low cost. If you're in the market for a design, one of the best platforms out there right now is Design Crowd. With Design Crowd, you have access to over 750,000 designers from all over the world. All you have to do is go to designcrowd.com, post a brief describing the design you need, and then Design Crowd will invite its 750,000 designers to submit designs based specifically on your post. Within hours, you'll receive your first design, and over the course of a week, a typical project will receive up to over 100 different designs from designers around the world. Then you just pick the one that you like best and approve payment to that one designer. It takes all of the guesswork out of freelancing. Right now, for a special $150 VIP offer for our listeners, check out designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness to learn more and save up to $150 when you start any project. That's designcrowd.com, D-E-S-I-G-N-C-R-O-W-D dot com forward slash health and wellness with no spaces, or simply enter the discount code health and wellness when posting a project on Design Crowd. Are you looking to learn more about the latest trends from the fitness world? Are you confused by all of the different trends that are out there? The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place for you. The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place to come for people of all skill and interest levels. Join us as we explore the latest trends in the fitness world. Does that new exercise really work? Should I try yoga? Whatever your question, chances are good you'll find an answer on the GSMC Fitness Podcast. talking about the rundown of SSRIs and their possible side effects. Now we're going to talk a little bit about SSRI safety and risks. So a lot of doctors do prescribe SSRIs before other types of antidepressants because they usually have fewer side effects than most other types. So they're generally pretty safe. I know I ran down the list of possible side effects with you guys, but overall, they're not that bad in the overall realm of possible side effects, at least in my general experience. So you may not get them, or you may. They're required to list them if people get those side effects during the drug trials. So there may be relatively few people who experience them, or there may have been a bunch, depending on which type of side effect it was, and the duration may have also varied greatly, but they do have to list it just in case. That's why they're called possible side effects instead of guaranteed side effects. So I have been on an antidepressant that is an SSRI for the past year, almost, and I have actually liked it quite a lot. I tried two different ones before that, and I did not enjoy those really all that much. One of them just made me dizzy a lot and a little spacey when I was coming up on it. But after a while, that side effect went away, but it just did not do what I needed it to do. It wasn't actually getting rid of the depression or helping me to deal with the depression. And I was on it for several months. We tried going up a couple of milligrams 
for it, a couple of dosages, to see if we could get that to work over a prolonged period of time. And that just didn't work for me, and that's okay. So I worked with my doctor, and we tried another one. That one wasn't really working for me. And so after about a year and a half, we finally found one that does work. So one thing I do want to point out is that there may be side effects, but talk with your doctor about them as well and see what you guys can do together. I did have to go off of my sleep medication at one point because it was making my arms go numb each night, and that's a rare side effect, but it's one that I got. I did not get any of the more common side effects, but remember, we're all different in a host of different ways, and that's why we try to look at this holistically. But just because one doesn't work for you doesn't mean another type might not. They all vary a little bit in precisely their dosages and how they work and a few other factors, including their side effects. So talk with your doctor about those. I'm pretty happy with mine at this point, although I have had some of the side effects when I changed the dosages or when I had to go off of it for a couple of weeks due to pharmacy issues and stuff with COVID-19 that we're not going to get into. Everyone has problems right now. Everyone's low on resources, and it's not something I plan to complain about. But sometimes surprising things happen, and going off of my SSRIs temporarily because I didn't have access to it is a lot different than going off of the other medications I'd been on before. So in that way, you may also be experiencing some different types of side effects. So you can have side effects going on to the medication and side effects going off of it. So the side effects we're talking about right now are the ones that you may get when you're going on to your medication, but later we're going to talk about discontinuation syndrome as well and what that may mean for you if you're going off of SSRIs. So with Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. In general, they're very safe drugs and there's some minor side effects, but it would be really hard for you to really hurt yourself, at least for most people, by taking the SSRI. But certain people should be cautious about using them, and that's generally going to be children and pregnant women. So in 2004, the FDA added a warning on drug labels for SSRIs because they can increase the risk of suicidal thoughts and behavior in children and adolescents. However, they've done some more studies since then, and it suggested that the benefits of the antidepressant meds may outweigh that risk, because the risk is more rare. It's another one of those things about having a possible side effect. It might not have affected that many people, but it affected enough that they needed to list it and make people aware. So if you are already having issues with suicidal ideation, then you may want to try a different type of medication and talk to your doctor about that. My doctor is very chill. That's why I drive an hour to go see her, even though I moved last year. And whenever I talk to her about this, she's like, okay, make sure that if anything changes, you let me know if you feel suicidal, you start thinking about death and stuff a lot more than normal go ahead and let me know and we'll talk about it and see if we need to maybe change your medication or change your dosage. So she's super mindful and sweet and very easy to talk to. If you feel uncomfortable talking to your specific doctor about it, try maybe seeing a different doctor. So I liked the doctor I had before too, but I am just much more comfortable with my current one's bedside manner And so that is why I go specifically to her and why my friends drive an hour down from another city in order to go and see her. She's just amazing. And I know not everyone has the privilege of having access to these different doctors due to monetary concerns or insurance issues. And indeed, I'm on a different insurance now, so I do have to pay out of pocket for going to see her. But for me, I'm able to do that and it's worth it. You may also not live in an area in which you're able to reach another doctor. Just like there are food deserts in a lot of places, there are a lot of underserved communities in the healthcare industry as well, and I totally understand if you can't reach them either. 
However, it is 2020 now, and a lot of places are moving more towards telemedicine, so you may be able to reach someone who is perhaps further than you're able to drive, or perhaps you don't have access to a car, but you may be able to still access healthcare in this way and get it mailed to you. You can get a lot of prescriptions mailed to you at this point as well by going through a telemedicine type of account. So I recommend checking that out as well, and they may well take your insurance too. So back to what we were talking about with kids having these increased risk of suicidal ideation. For pregnant women, it's a little bit different. So SSRIs can increase the risk of certain birth defects, particularly those related to the heart and lung development. Doctors and moms-to-be need to sit down and talk with each other about the risks of SSRI treatment compared to the risks of not treating the depression because depressive symptoms without treatment can also negatively impact your pregnancy. Depressed women may not seek the prenatal care they need. They may not be as good about drug compliance, taking the medication as they should, when they should, even when they're at home. And that's not a blame statement at all. Being depressed is more than just being sad. It can make it really hard for you to get out of bed or to even make food or to be hungry or eat the appropriate foods that you need normally. And this can be a particular risk if you are pregnant and you are growing a life inside of you. So you have to weigh those pros and cons with your doctor. There's a lot of hormonal components changing in your body during pregnancy too, and that can impact you. So remember, your doctor is your partner in your healthcare discussions, and they want to find the best treatment plan for you. So some pregnant women might switch their SSRI to reduce their risk while still treating their depression. And that's because different SSRIs have some different side effects. So Paxil is linked with fetal heart defects and trouble breathing and brain disorders in newborns. So a lot of doctors may recommend that folks on Paxil who are pregnant switch to Prozac or Celexa when they become pregnant because those SSRIs are not associated with such serious side effects. So You don't have to go completely off of all antidepressants, you guys. There may be a better choice out there. Even within the subcategory of antidepressants, that subcategory of SSRIs, there are several different ones and they have different types of side effects. So you may be able to find a treatment that works well for you in the very similar way to what your other medication is by still selectively inhibiting the reuptake of your serotonin, so by selectively preventing it from going into your bloodstream instead of being used in your brain. And in that way, you can still have one that works well for you. So the ones I was on before, I was on an SNRI, and I was on, I believe, an MAOI at one point. So those were different types, and they did not work as well for me. But at this point, because I like the one that I'm on, I am on Prozac, Fluoxetine, then perhaps I would swap to Celexa or something if it was no longer working as well for me or if I was pregnant and was having side effects that were unrelated to the fetal heartbeat because, as we discussed, Prozac is not associated with that. But maybe I would try Celexa or something instead if I sat down with my doctor and was like, hey... I'm having trouble sleeping already, and with changing the dosage with my Prozac, I'm now having a lot more trouble sleeping. Could we maybe try another SSRI? And your doctor is very willing to have these discussions with you. At least they should be. If they aren't, then perhaps speak with another doctor. Some questions you might want to ask them include whether you're at a high risk of side effects from the SSRIs, depending on any other medical issues that you may have. And that's why it's so important to disclose to your doctor and to be comfortable telling your doctor the vulnerable things in your life, like if you are having suicidal ideation. 
So you want to make sure that you're able to tell them the truth and be honest so that they can let you know if you are at a higher risk of side effects. If you are also on other medications, including birth control and stuff, if you're using supplements like vitamins, you should also mention that to your doctor and ask whether any of those medications may interact with an SSRI. Sometimes you would be very surprised as to what will interact with your medication. One of the meds I was on, you could not have grapefruit with it. Good thing I don't like grapefruit to begin with, so that wasn't really a a deal breaker for me. But if you are a person who loves grapefruit and that's your go-to breakfast, then you might not necessarily want to be on that if there are other options for you. So you don't have to take the first one that is mentioned either. You can ask about other options. You can ask if talk therapy might be a good option for you instead of medication, how long it would take an SSRI to start working for you, and whether or not you can stop taking it if your depression improves. So you can also do talk therapy in combination with your medication as well. And a lot of times your doctor will be able to provide you with a referral to a counselor should you wish to go that route as well. We're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some risks of antidepressants. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. talking about some of the possible side effects of going on antidepressants and SSRI safety, specifically as it relates to children and pregnant women, as well as the importance of having a doctor you are comfortable being vulnerable with in order to have the necessary discussions to help inform them as to whether you may be more likely to be at a higher risk of side effects. And so they can really act as a fully informed partner in your treatment plan. Now we're going to talk about some risks of antidepressants. So we talked about the basic ones earlier, but some patients who take SSRIs may also develop joint and muscle pain, skin rashes, etc. And those are generally temporary or mild or both. So the duration may be short-lived and the severity of it may be mild. However, there can be more serious potential problems like reduced blood clotting capacity. Now, why would a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor cause problems with your blood clotting? Well, that's because since it is keeping the serotonin being recycled in your brain instead of being reabsorbed through the blood, you don't have as much of the neurotransmitter serotonin in the platelets within your blood. So, that can cause you to have an increased risk for internal bleeding, especially if you're also taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, or naproxen. So, check out our episode on NSAIDs as well if you have questions about how those work. You may also have sexual side effects from SSRIs. They can diminish sexual interest, desire, the ability to perform, 
how satisfied you feel, or all of the above. In men, SSRIs can delay or even prevent ejaculation, and in women, delay or prevent orgasm. So lowering the dose of your SSRI antidepressant can help, but you may also lose the drug's benefit in trying to find that happy medium. Another solution that doctors may sometimes turn to is adding or substituting bupropion, or well, butrin, which works in a different way and does not generally cause sexual side effects. So although having depression in general can also reduce your sex drive, if you feel like the SSRIs are not helping that, even if you are feeling less depressed than general, or if your sex drive was fine before, despite the depression and or anxiety, and now you're having trouble with it, then talk to your doctor about that, and they may well be able to give you another medication or a different dosage that will not be causing that problem. Because it's not just about your health, it's also about your wellness, and they want you to feel well and to be happy with who you are and how your body is functioning. That's why they put you on antidepressants to help you out to begin with. So for your drug interactions, let's talk about how SSRIs are broken down. In your liver is where SSRIs are broken down, and that's done by a group of enzymes known as the cytochrome P450 system. A lot of other drugs are also metabolized or processed by that system. So it depends on the types of drugs that you're taking as to what the interaction may be. There may be a higher or a lower blood level of the two drugs, and sometimes you just need a dose adjustment in order to use both of those drugs simultaneously. Or your doctor may tell you that you need to avoid one of them or swap to a totally different type that may be more helpful and less dangerous. If you are taking an SSRI with another drug that increases serotonin activity, then you may also get a rare condition called serotonin syndrome. You see this present as somebody having a racing heartbeat. There may be a lot of excessive sweating, a high fever, and blood pressure, sometimes delirium as well. Non-human animals can also get this too. I actually first read about serotonin syndrome in cats well before I was ever on SSRIs and had to read about that for humans. When our dog died a few years back, the cat took it particularly hard. We all took it really hard, but the cat particularly so, and she would walk around the house crying and looking for him, and she stopped eating for the most part. So we had to put her on an appetite stimulant, and one of the side effects of that could be serotonin syndrome. So we had to watch out for those types of side effects in the cat. So things like her having a racing heart or panting a lot as they don't really sweat or having a higher fever or the cat having high blood pressure and even being kind of delirious. So it can look pretty similar in non-human animals as well as in human animals. So that's a little bit off topic, sort of, as we're talking about, I guess, cat wellness at this point. But it is possible for animals to get that too. And I was surprised that her appetite stimulant could do that, but it's because of the way that it works. So with humans, we can also get serotonin syndrome. And in particular, we should not be mixing SSRIs with herbal remedies like St. John's wort. You might not think of it initially, but weird things can go ahead and interact with this in unexpected ways. So just like with the cat's case in which she was getting an appetite stimulant and it could have resulted in serotonin syndrome, you don't want to mix SSRIs with some herbal remedies. You don't want to mix them with MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And you also don't want to necessarily mix it with lithium. It has been reported when an SSRI has been combined with lithium, which is a standard treatment for bipolar disorder, that some folks do end up with serotonin syndrome. So you do want to try to find 
that happy medium with your doctor and even tell your doctor if you are on supplements, whether they are herbal remedies or vitamins. It's always important to disclose that. So when they ask you if you're on any other medications, they don't just mean over-the-counter or prescribed medications. That also means any supplements, herbal or otherwise, that you may be taking on your own. Now, the good news is that SSRIs are safer than tricyclic antidepressants for older people because they don't tend to disturb your heart rhythm and they rarely cause dizziness that may cause older people to fall and get hurt, especially if they have a lower bone density, as it tends to happen as we get older. But liver function is also less efficient in older people. Our organs in general are a little less efficient as we get older. And we discussed this in one of our episodes on alcohol, in which we found that up to the age of 65, men can drink up to two drinks per day, and they should be fine. But once they hit 65, men should go down to one drink per day because the liver is less efficient. So that applies here, too. There is a greater risk of drug interactions involving that cytochrome P450 system that uses those enzymes to break down the SSRIs in the liver. So for that reason, older people do best with the types of SSRIs that are metabolized really rapidly, like sertraline. So if you have antidepressants and you are using them for a prolonged period of time, Sometimes they may lose their effect after months or years, and that's because your brain is increasing its tolerance and just becoming less responsive to the drug. When that happens, talk to your doctor about it. If that happens, talk to your doctor about it, and they may provide you with a solution like increasing your dose or switching to another antidepressant that works in a different way. Keep in mind that even after pregnancy, when you're breastfeeding, you may want to speak with your doctor about the type of SSRIs that you're on. So paroxetine and sertraline do tend to be preferred by a lot of doctors in that case because they don't appear to reach significant levels within the breast milk that could be transmitted on to the baby. So while you're pregnant, they may put you on Prozac, and then while you are breastfeeding, they may want to swap you over to Zoloft or Paxil at that point. That's just going to depend on you and your doctor and the conversation that you have. All right, we're going to go on another break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about discontinuation syndrome. Stay tuned. Seeing your business idea come to life is one of the most fulfilling and exciting parts of being an entrepreneur. And nothing says that you're up and running and ready to take on the market like having a personalized logo, website, or business card. Design Crowd can help get you to that place. Design Crowd is a website that helps entrepreneurs, startups, and small businesses crowdsource their custom logo, business card, and web design from designers around the world. They have over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas and make sure you get the perfect custom design every time. With crowdsourcing, Design Crowd takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and makes sure that you only have to pay for specifically the design that you love. Right now, for a special $150 VIP offer for our listeners, check out designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness to learn more and save up to $150 when you start any project. That's D-E-S-I-G-N-C-R-O-W-D dot com forward slash health and wellness with no spaces or simply go to designcrowd.com and enter the discount code health and wellness with no spaces when posting a project on Design Crowd. Let Design Crowd help you see your business idea come to life today. 
the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Now we're going to talk about the risks of going off of antidepressants. So discontinuing medications, in general, they are recommended for you to taper them down. So that just refers to gradually decreasing the dosage that you're on until it's at a safe level in your body to go on another medication. A lot of SSRIs work by maintaining their status in your body by using them each day. That's why we tend to take our medications at the same time each day. That's why we should be taking them that way. And it works kind of like birth control in that manner. You need to be taking it at the same time each day to help it build steady, stable levels of it in your body. And it takes a while after you go off of it to get out of your system, depending on the type that you're on. So it's very important that when you're ready to go off of antidepressants, or if you need to go off of them for some reason, that you discuss it ahead of time with your doctor and work out how to change or stop taking that antidepressant gradually to help you avoid something known as discontinuation syndrome. So discontinuation syndrome really is describing a whole bunch of different symptoms that could occur in patients who are on SSRIs or SNRIs and stop them suddenly or drastically. SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So they help you keep more serotonin and more norepinephrine being in use in your brain. So some of the symptoms of discontinuation syndrome may be nausea, feelings of vertigo, trouble sleeping, having some odd sensory symptoms, so like pinging feelings in your skin or what some people describe as being kind of a zapping sensation in your brain. That's called brain flutters is the actual term for it. And you may also feel anxious. So as many as one in five people who stop an antidepressant quickly, may experience at least a mild version of discontinuation syndrome. That usually occurs if you've been taking the medication for a minimum of six weeks or longer, and it's more likely to happen if you've been taking it for a long time. So when you stop taking it, some of those antidepressants leave your body quickly, depending on the type that they are. And that's talking about their half-life, how long it takes to dissipate and get out of your body. So they have a short half-life. And then others may leave your body more slowly, and that's called a long half-life. So you can get discontinuation syndrome either way. It just depends on whether the drug is stopped abruptly, but the severity may be a little bit different depending on your dosage and precisely which SSRI or SNRI that you are on. The symptoms for it usually start about two to four days after you stop the medicine, and they generally go away after about four to six weeks, but in rare cases, they may last up to a year. So it's a really good idea to talk to your doctor about tapering yourself off of it if you need to go off of it in any way. And there are a lot of reasons that folks may want or need to go off of their antidepressants. And that is totally okay, but it is something you want to do with your doctor. 
So, for example, a lot of folks pair medication and talk therapy together for the treatment of their depression. So if you've been working with a counselor, whether that be someone who is specifically a counselor or a social worker who's trained in counseling or a psychologist and so on, there are so many different types of counselors, you guys, then you may end up really trusting that person and feeling like your depressive symptoms are getting better and you might want to move towards more talk therapy or keeping the talk therapy level where you're at and going down on your depression medication. And everyone is different, so that is something to talk to your therapist about and to your doctor to see what they both think about that topic. So if you decide to do that and they both feel that it's a good idea for you as well, go ahead and work closely with the doctor who's prescribing your medicine. Some drugs can be stopped or even tapered really quickly, but most SSRIs and SNRIs in particular need to be slowly, incrementally decreased. So you may be instructed to lower your dosage by small amounts each week or every two weeks or even every month, depending on what type you're on and what dosage of medication that you were on. Your tapering may take a couple of weeks It may take six months, depending on which SSRI you're on or which SNRI, and specifically what the dosage for that particular one is that you are on. And I know that it can seem like a long time, but in the grand scheme of life, it's only six months, and you don't want to rush it because discontinuation syndrome is terrible. I have experienced it firsthand now, you guys, and it's not great. I do not love it. And then you have to taper back up when you get back on it. So that comes with potentially more side effects at that point. You don't want to go through that. The brain flutters alone are terrible. So you don't want to go through that. Make sure that you are talking to your doctor about it and stick with you're tapering the way that your doctor prescribes it. If you start having symptoms of discontinuation syndrome, talk to your doctor again to make sure that you can change that step-down dosage. Sometimes they can prescribe it in tablet form instead of capsule form, and that way you can snap it in half even to change that dosage just a little bit at a time if lowering it by the milligram amount that they have already told you to is resulting in some unpleasant symptoms of discontinuation syndrome. Now, a lot of these are really safe medications, you guys. But once your body gets used to having a certain type of thing going on with it, you need to taper it down. And one of my friends right now is getting to taper hers down, and I'm so excited for her. She's also very excited, and she has her own different methods that she uses now to deal with any symptoms of depression, and that is what she and her doctor think is best for her right now. So it's okay if you're on it for a little bit, and then you and your doctor decide that it's time that you can come off of it, or you want to come off of it, and you can taper that down and try that together. But it's also okay if you are on this for the long term. Everyone is different, and there should be no shame or stigma associated with these mental health issues. We are all impacted by different problems in our lives to different degrees. And sometimes those issues are in the environment, so things that happen to us or around us. And other times it's due to different problems in our bodies with our neurotransmitters and stuff. So things that happen within us. It's just like having any other type of affliction and you want to make sure that you do talk to your doctor about it so that you can have the best, most fulfilling life that you can possibly have. All right, we're going to go on a quick break and when we come back, we're going to talk about appropriately going off of antidepressants. 
Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Before the break, we were talking about discontinuation syndrome, which is something that may happen if you go off of your SSRIs too suddenly. So now we're going to talk about how to appropriately go off of your antidepressants to help make sure you don't have a relapse of depression or get discontinuation syndrome. So as you take this medication over time, you may get to the point where you feel like you no longer need the pills. So once you've discussed that with your doctor and also your psychologist, if that applies, then you can start working on a discontinuation method with your doctor that will help prevent discontinuation syndrome. So why do you get withdrawal symptoms, more or less, with antidepressants? Well, They work by changing the levels of those neurotransmitters in your body. Remember, neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that attach to the receptor sites, those docks on your nerve cells, your neurons, all throughout your body, and impact their activity. So neurons eventually adapt to the current level of neurotransmitters you have in your body, in this case with SSRIs, serotonin. And symptoms that may be mild to distressing can happen if the level changes too much too fast. So if you suddenly stop taking your antidepressant, then your body may not be too happy about that. It's generally not medically dangerous, but it can be very uncomfortable for you and it may be problematic in other ways. So not getting good quality sleep or just having sleep problems in general may not necessarily be medically dangerous, but you also have to think about the type of job that you have and the extent that this could impact your job. Are you operating heavy machinery? Then you may seriously want to make sure you're tapering off appropriately. But it's not just high-risk jobs that can see problems with this. Remember, we're approaching this from a holistic perspective, and you want to think about your wellness, your mental and your emotional wellness, how much you are going to have to deal with, with having perhaps nausea or vertigo or trouble sleeping or those brain flutters. It may even make you feel anxious. So we don't want to up our anxiety while we're trying to lower our doses that we are taking for our depression, that's not going to be good news bears. So we really need to take all of those things into account. Think about how that may impact your day-to-day life in whatever form that takes. So what you do for fun, what you do for work, etc. It's not just about your health. It is also about your wellness and you went on the antidepressants in order to feel better and to be able to actively go through your day and have the energy to do these day-to-day tasks and you don't want to sap that out of yourself going off of the antidepressants because that's really not doing yourself any favors and it is in direct opposition to what you were initially taking it for to begin with. However... Having discontinuation symptoms does not mean that you are addicted to your antidepressant. 
A person who is addicted to something craves that drug, and they generally need higher and higher doses. Most people who are on antidepressants do not develop a craving or a feel to increase the dose. Sometimes SRIs or SSRIs will stop working, and they sometimes call that Prozac poop out, which means that you may need to increase the dose or add another drug in there. But it's not necessarily an addiction. It's just your brain is used to that certain level of serotonin in your body, and so you have to gradually decrease it. But most people do not crave SSRIs. So keep that in mind as well. An antidepressant withdrawal can look a lot like depression though. Discontinuation symptoms can also actually include depression and not just anxiety. So that can cause a lot of problems if you are going off of them too quickly and you're starting to get these symptoms of depression again. You might think that as you're going off of these that you're having a relapse and you need ongoing treatment, but you should talk to your doctor to help distinguish discontinuation symptoms from a relapse. To start with, though, here is some information about that so you're prepared to go into this conversation with your doctor. Discontinuation symptoms usually start within days to weeks of stopping the meds or lowering the dose. And relapse symptoms tend to develop a lot later and more gradually. Discontinuation symptoms often include physical problems, physical ailments that aren't really common in depression, like dizziness. You may feel flu-like symptoms even, or those abnormal sensations we refer to as those brain flutters that almost feel like you are getting zapped in your brain. The discontinuation symptoms also disappear pretty quickly if you take a dose of the antidepressant, depending on which type it is, but treating depression as a total ailment takes several weeks in general to work. Discontinuation symptoms also tend to fade out as your body readjusts to the current levels in your body, but recurrent depression will continue and may get worse. So that is mostly the differences between discontinuation symptoms and a relapse in depression. If your symptoms are lasting more than a month and are tending to get worse, then you might be having a relapse and you should definitely talk to your doctor about that. During the antidepressant tapering down, you may experience several different types of symptoms, and we talked about them at a glance in our last segment, but now we're going to talk about them a little bit more in depth. So in addition to nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, you may also have digestive issues related to a loss of appetite or even having cramps. You may flush a lot or have difficulty tolerating hot weather You may have trouble sleeping or have unusual dreams or nightmares. I had a lot of crazy nightmares, you guys. I was having nightmares absolutely every night, and they were incredibly wild. Now, on the one hand, they were very interesting. But on the other, I can vividly remember all of them, and it very much disrupted my sleep. So that's no fun. And they're not just uh, strange dreams is not what I had. I had downright nightmares. So that wasn't great. It disrupted my sleep. I wasn't happy about it. So you can have all kinds of different sleep changes. You can also get dizzy or lightheaded or feel like you don't quite have sea legs when walking. So you may have some wobbly legs, almost like that feeling when you go and work out and it's leg day and you get jelly legs. I love jelly legs when it's leg day, but I do not love it when it is not leg day and I'm not getting gains and I'm instead just wobbling around my house. It's not great. You may also experience some tremors, some restless legs, your gait, the way that you walk may be uneven, G-A-I-T, and you may have difficulty coordinating your speech and your chewing movements. 
I don't know about you guys, but that is quite a lot. It can also bother you with giving you unwanted feelings like mood swings, or you may feel really agitated or anxious or manic or depressed or irritable or confused or even paranoid or suicidal. It can give you mood swings all over the place. It's going to magnify the little things that might normally make you kind of annoyed and then you just end up really agitated about it. You may feel kind of like you're crawling out of your skin, in my experience, where it's just like, I need to get out. And that can be particularly problematic right now in this era of social distancing. So I do go out for walks and stay six feet away, at least from other people. But I can't go to my gym right now, so my normal outlet for my anxiety and depression, aside from my medication, I don't have access to that at this point. So I'm going to have to find something different to do, because the walking is nice, but it's not quite doing it for me. I need a more active workout. I'm used to weightlifting and stuff, but I don't have that whole setup in my home. So we want to make sure that we are being mindful of that within the social distancing parameters as well, because that's just another layer that may also already be making folks feel more anxious and or depressed. I think the part of being confused is the one of the worst parts of it. I hate being confused. I often say it's my least favorite emotion. I know confusion is not technically an emotion, it's more of a state of mind, but thanks, I hate it. I hate it a lot, you guys. It is the absolute worst. I hate being confused, and I also hate just not knowing things. It's the knowing that there's something that I don't know that bothers me, if that makes sense. So I would rather be sad or angry or just about any other emotion than confused. So that is the terrible part for me, the particularly terrible part of the antidepressant withdrawal symptoms. I hesitate to refer to it as withdrawal, even though it is listed as that in the literature in some places, because I feel that it colloquially implies addiction, but I do mean discontinuation syndrome in general. I think that, at least in my experience, discontinuation syndrome is best summed up by a quote from Charles Darwin that I have thought of a lot lately. And it says, But I am very poorly today and very stupid, and I hate everybody and everything. One lives only to make blunders. So I identify very strongly with Darwin in that sentiment during discontinuation syndrome. It's awful. You... (laughs) just feel kind of dumb and I feel clumsy and again, thanks, I hate it. So I also have those strange sensations. So I'm feeling just incredibly clumsy. In the past week, I have spilled a can of Coca-Cola. I have tripped over a wire in my room. I can't remember the last time I've fallen, you guys, in years. I haven't fallen in years And I tripped over a cord and fell over in my floor and I sent a bottle of water or rather a full cup of water and a cup of coffee flying across my room. And I now have a coffee stain on my wall that I'm going to have to paint over. But I already have the paint from the apartment complex. It will be fine. But it's flat paint. And so I could not just scrub it off. It just turns the wall white and removes the texture. So I got off what I could. But yesterday, I also spilt a beer. I've spilt things on my body, on my walls. Oh, there's there's been a lot. I also spilt the Coke. So I've spilt four things in the last week or so. And I'm generally not that clumsy. I'm a little clumsy sometimes. But, I mean, I played organized sports growing up. I'm not that clumsy. I'm able to have my wits and balance about me. But with discontinuation syndrome, I just feel very poorly and stupid and everything feels like it takes twice as long, to be honest. And I have to really think about my speech as I'm saying it as well, because I'm having a lot of difficulty coordinating it. And that's not normally a problem for me. 
I'm one of those weird people who will just wing a bridesmaid speech at a wedding because I know how I feel about those people in my heart. And so I just do it off the cuff with however it feels best and most sincere in the moment. I'm quite comfortable with public speaking in many different contexts. But right now, I definitely feel like Darwin and those brain zaps or brain flutters are the worst. You can also get pain or numbness in your body. I've been having a little bit of trouble with my arms going numb. And you can get hypersensitive to sounds or get a ringing in your ears, like tinnitus. I already have tinnitus normally, and this has not been super great in exacerbating that and making me sweat more than I usually do, which I did not actually realize was a symptom of discontinuation syndrome up until I researched it to discuss it with you guys today. So at least there is that, and that explains why I have been more sweaty even when it is only like 70 degrees in my house right now. I'm definitely not going through menopause right now. I don't have any other types of those symptoms. I'm 31. I'm not at the right age for it. It is discontinuation syndrome. So I'm having a bunch of these different symptoms and it's not been great. So I say that to let you guys know that if you're going through something like that right now, or you have in the past, or you may in the future, you are not alone. And if you don't recognize what those symptoms are because you don't know about them, then you're not able to seek help about it. So when I went to my doctor to re-up my medication this last time, I did also tell her that I hadn't had access to it for a few weeks. And she was like, oh, that's really important that you told me that. Thank you. Make sure when you start taking this again that you break those pills in half. I'm going to prescribe you the tablet form that can be broken in half and only take half for the first week or two so you can go ahead and incrementally step that back up. So that's what I've been doing, and it's helped, but I am still feeling very poorly and stupid and I hate everything, and one lives only to make blunders. And that includes me being clumsy, and that includes clumsiness with my speech and with my actual body right now. So I'm all over the place, you guys, but that's okay. We are all all over the place at certain points in our lives, and I think it's really important to be honest with you guys about the difficult times in addition to the good times, because that just makes sure that we are all on the same page of knowing that none of us are perfect, life is difficult, and there is someone out there who understands you and totally empathizes with what you're going through in this type of way. If you guys ever want to talk to me about this kind of thing, you're also welcome to hit me up on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for GSMC. We're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the half-lives of these medications and how to really go off of them step by step. Stay tuned. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. discontinuation syndrome can look like a relapse in depression as well as what those symptoms really look like in general on paper 
as well as my anecdotal experience with it. So now we're going to talk about these antidepressant drugs, half-lives, and how to go off of the antidepressants. I do want to also note that although my symptoms and my experience has not been great in that regard, that is because I suddenly had to stop taking them and that this likely would not have happened if I had been able to taper off of them. So keep that in mind right now, too, with coronavirus and filling your prescriptions as you're able to. If you can get a multiple month supply in the mail ahead of time, that may be less taxing on your local pharmacy as well. My pharmacy was very nice about it. There were multiple reasons why I was not able to get access to that. But one of the reasons was the pharmacy did not have that particular prescription At the time, they were about out of it, so they were going to just give it to me for free at that point because they only had a partial subset of my meds. But if I had accepted it, then I would not have been able to get the actual correct new dosage of my medication either. So there was a lot going on, and they did their best to mitigate what they could, but it took me over an hour in the pharmacy line outside, and there were only like four cars in front of me, you guys, because a lot of other folks were also inside, I do believe. So everyone is overtaxed right now, and it's important to keep that in mind because you want to take good care of your mental health and your emotional wellness right now. While we are in this COVID-19 era especially, some of us were already having problems before, and it can make it worse right now. So Check your medication levels, you guys. Check when you have to go back to your doctor in order to get another prescription and maybe go back a little bit early if you're able to, especially since we have these telemedicine visits available to us right now to make it easier. Let's use these 21st century solutions to these timeless human problems. All right. So that said, I just want to make sure that you guys know I'm not discouraging you from trying to go off of your antidepressants. Just make sure you talk with your doctor about it and look at tapering for that. Because they have a bunch of different half-lives as well. People who tend to discontinue rapidly over just one to seven days are also more likely to relapse within a few months than folks who tapered it over two or more weeks. And that comes from a Harvard Medical School study of nearly 400 patients, and two-thirds of them were women, and they followed them for over a year after they stopped taking their antidepressants that were prescribed for mood and anxiety disorders. So, with your SSRIs in particular, it takes about 24 hours for Paxil to be 50% out of your body. That's its half-life. 99% of it will be out of your body in 4.4 days. For sertraline, Zoloft, that's going to be 26 hours for the half-life and about five and a half days to get 99% of it out. Lexapro, 27 to 32 hours or 6.1 days for a half out and 99% out. For Celexa, 36 hours for the half-life and 7.3 days to get 99% of it out. And for Prozac, four to six days for the half-life and 25 days for the 99% of it being out of your body. Now, they also have a list online for SNRIs and for dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. But this episode's specifically about SSRIs. So we're going to leave it at that right now and talk about how to go off of your SSRIs step-by-step. Although, make sure you do, as always, talk to a doctor. First up, you want to take your time. A lot of folks are tempted to stop taking antidepressants as soon as the symptoms ease up, but the depression can return if you quit it too soon. Doctors are generally going to recommend that you stay on it for six to nine months before considering going off of it, even if you feel like you've already felt better. If you have had three or more recurrences of depression, then that's going to be at least two years of being on this medication and 
really feeling good about it before you go off of it. So you want to talk to your doctor about the specific benefits and risks of your antidepressants and work with them to figure out whether or when to stop using them. You should also make sure that you are feeling really confident that you are functioning solidly. You want to make sure that you're able to do those little day-to-day tasks that we tend to really put off when we're depressed, even though we know it's only going to take us 15 minutes to file our taxes or recertify our student loans and stuff like that. We put them off for a long time and they give us some anxiety or we just don't have the energy for it as well. You want to make sure you're able to do even those little things at that point because that may be a symptom of your depression and not being able to function that well and able to get those things done. And that's different from procrastinating because procrastinating means you just don't want to deal with it right now. Whereas with depression and anxiety, you just feel like you can't handle it right now or you just don't have the energy to do it and you just keep end up procrastinating because of the depression and anxiety. So in this case, it's more like procrastination is a symptom of your depression and that's why things aren't getting done rather than being the sole cause. So go ahead and talk to your doctor about that. Make sure that your life circumstances are stable. So hopefully you have a job going on for you, although I'm definitely not shaming anyone who decides they have to go off of it because of the price, but also talk to your doctor about a type that may be less expensive. Talk to your pharmacist about it. At my local pharmacy, it is really cheap to get my medication directly from that pharmacy than it is to go to other pharmacies or even to use my insurance in a lot of cases. And there is a price difference between being prescribed capsules versus tablets. So I asked my doctor to swap it over to tablets because the capsules were crazy more expensive for no real good reason. So do keep that in mind as well. There may be another recourse. But you want to make sure that if at all possible, your life circumstances are stable, that you can cope with any negative thoughts that might pop up for you, And you don't want to try to quit these while you're stressed out or going through significant changes in your life, whether that is starting a new job or experiencing an illness or right now the pressure cooker environment of having to be in government-imposed isolation due to COVID-19 concerns in order to keep everyone else safe. You also want to make a plan. So you're going to have to reduce that dose gradually And doctors are generally going to have you do two to six weeks between your dose reductions. Usually, it's going to be about a 10 milligram reduction in my experience, but that is going to be up to the discretion of your doctor. Remember, I am not a doctor. I am just a researcher. So your doctor can help you in tapering that dose and prescribing the appropriate dosage forms for helping you with that change. And that schedule may also depend on which one you're taking, how long you've been on it, your current dose, and any symptoms you had during previous medication changes, as well as symptoms that you may be having during this current medication change. It's important to report that to them as well, especially if you are having a long duration of these symptoms or if you are having more moderate to severe symptoms, they may be able to change that dose further for you or recommend that you get a pill cutter to take it down in smaller increments. So you should also perhaps keep a mood calendar for yourself to record your mood on a scale of 1 to 10 on a daily basis. Your doctor may ask you to use a different scale, whatever works best for you, and we call that a Likert scale. When it's on a scale of like 1 to 10 or 1 to 5 where you are ranking things that have kind of these set intervals. So you may do that in a different way. It just depends on what your doctor and if you're also doing talk therapy, your psychologist may want to work on with you. 
you may also consider starting psychotherapy. So fewer than 20% of people who are on antidepressants actually go to psychotherapy, but it can be really helpful and important in recovering from depression and avoiding a relapse. So they performed a metadata study at Harvard Medical School, and they found that people who undergo psychotherapy while tapering off of their antidepressants are less likely to have a relapse. You can also work on this by staying active. So having good nutrition, working on your stress reduction techniques. Remember to perform self-care, you guys. And getting regular sleep and working out can help out a lot. So if you are like me and your gym is closed right now, you've got to find something to do that's different. I've been trying yoga And that's just not cutting it for me, you guys. So I'm going to have to find something different to work that out for me. And that's okay if the first thing that you try doesn't stick. We are just looking for things that work for us as individuals. And there is no one-size-fits-all exercise to magically help everyone reduce their stress and feel better with their anxiety or depression. However... There is research that shows that people are less likely to relapse after recovering from depression if they exercise three times a week or more. That exercise helps make your serotonin more available to bind to those neurons in those little docking sites, the receptor sites. So it can help you deal with a lot of those changes in your serotonin levels as you're tapering off of SSRIs. So if you are having some issues in the tapering system, maybe exercise a little bit more and that might help you out if you haven't been doing that along with it. It's not going to just fix everything. I'm not one of those people who's going to tell you that exercise is going to fix all of your depression issues. However, it is going to be helpful in setting your body up for success to the best of your ability. You can also seek support. So stay in touch with your doctor as you go through it. Let them know if you have any physical or emotional or mental symptoms that could be related to discontinuation syndrome as we discussed today. If they're mild, they'll probably just let you know that they're temporary and just the result of the medication trying to get out of your system. Sometimes they may recommend or prescribe taking a non-antidepressant meds for a little bit like antihistamines or anti-anxiety meds or sleeping aids to help with some of those symptoms. But if the symptoms are severe, you might have to go back to the previous dose for a little bit and then reduce the levels more slowly. If you're taking one that has a short half-life, they may want you to swap to a longer-acting drug to help with that. You also may want to talk to a friend about it, a family member or a close friend, and have that type of support system too. If folks around you know that you're discontinuing antidepressants and may occasionally be grumpy or be agitated or even tear up, then they're less likely to take it personally. It can be really difficult to have those conversations and it can make you feel very vulnerable. But in my experience, people tend to take it well. I didn't know how to have those conversations for a long time, but I'm getting better at it. And now I can talk to my boss and go, hey, this is what I have going on. And folks are surprisingly understanding you guys. Now, granted, not everyone is going to be receptive. We can't control the actions or reactions of others, but working on having those conversations, especially with close friends or people in general you're close to in your life, can also help you out a lot in getting you used to having those conversations and finding the best way to have those conversations to help make you more comfortable with them in different contexts. And the more that we are open about this stuff when we're comfortable doing so can really help to eliminate the stigma associated with mental health issues. Additionally, having a close friend or family member know what's going on might also help you recognize if you're having a relapse that you might not perceive. 
My buddy Elliot told me proximity is blinding. He said that to me once when we were in undergrad, and that's always really stuck with me. So you may not even notice it in the moment, but your friend or family member from the outside who has a little bit more distance may be able to see something that you may not. Lastly, you want to make sure you complete your tapering. So by the time you finish taking that med, your dose is going to be very small. Your doctor may have you cutting your pills in half or even using a liquid form to get smaller and smaller doses. Some psychiatrists even prescribe a single 20 milligram tablet of fluoxetine, Prozac, the day after the last dose of a shorter acting one to ease the final flow of it getting out of your body. But that approach has not necessarily been tested in a clinical trial. It's something that they are doing off-label, essentially. So you also want to check in with your doctor one month after you've stopped taking the meds altogether, just as a follow-up appointment, so they can make sure that if you have had any discontinuation symptoms, that they've eased up and there are no signs of your depression recurring or relapsing. They may also recommend ongoing monthly check-ins to see how you are doing as you get further along. Because as we discussed, discontinuation syndrome symptoms tend to start a few days after you stop taking the meds. But having a relapse of depression tends to happen gradually and much later on. So it may seem like it's odd for them to ask you to come in at that point, but it's just to make sure that you're still doing well and checking for any symptoms that it may have come back at that point. That's all I have for y'all today. Stay safe and take care of yourselves and each other, you guys. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program